What's up everybody? It is time for New Life at Your House. Thanks so much for having us in today. We're pumped to be with you and we just want you to know what we're all about here at New Life. It's all about you loving God and loving people better every single day. And we believe that our service today is gonna really help with that. So yep. we're pumped to have you. Before we get started, we're gonna pray, but we just wanna remind you guys that this is not a virtual church. It's an everywhere church with a virtual sermon. And so if you don't know anybody, if you're watching alone, we would love for you to reach out so that we can get to know you, help you, and really just be friends and be family together. So let's go ahead and pray and get, get into service today. Yep. Lord, thank you for this time that we get to worship you. Thank you for the the uh, church body that we get to worship with from all over the country, even different places in the world. Thank you for the families that are gathered around the service. Thank you for the friends, the watch parties, but also Lord, thank you for every person that's worshiping alone today. We ask that you would speak to them, touch them in the way that they need this morning and provide them connection to, to the body of believers to be able to uh, reach more people, to be able to know you better, to grow deeper, and um, ultimately Lord, to be able to give you the glory back all the time. We just ask that you would eliminate distractions this morning and speak to us. It's in your name, amen. Amen, enjoy worship. Hey everyone, thanks for having us at your house today. Let's worship. Oh 
it's not like you. Whatever it is, no, I don't want it there. See, I will make room. God, I need you to move. Anything out of your way, if it takes your space. Thanks so much for worshiping through song with us just now. I hope that ministered to you. And we just know that every time we lift up praises to the Lord, he's there in our midst, that he literally meets with us. And that's one of my favorite parts of what we get to do, that we get to sing, we get to lift up his praises and invite his presence into our lives. And we get to do that um, through all the ways we worship, whether it's through prayer or through hearing the word or preaching the word or whatever, opening the Bible even. But we're about to do it through another form, which is through giving. Which right now, we want to invite you guys to, to take part in that because we believe your generosity is what God uses to multiply the kingdom through new life at your house. And so if you text 94,000, the word generosity, you'll get a text back immediately with a link that'll bring you right to where you need to go to either set up your one-time donation, your one-time partnership, or set up your recurring partnership so that you can see how God will continue to use you as you give every week or every other week. So we just want to thank those of you who do give and let you know that we see God using that all of the time. And for those of you that are going to do it for the first time today, we want to thank you and we are so glad to have you as a part of the family. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks so much for partnering with us just now. Uh, we're about to jump into the word. We are in the book of Acts, everybody. We are in season three of The Greatest Story Ever Told. We're almost finished, but we've got a few more stories and, and lessons for you out of this. So enjoy. Thanks again for inviting us into your place of worship where we are learning to establish the church. The church in such a way that it begins to grow and expand the big K kingdom of God. Not our small K kingdom of our little group that, reach, that meets right here, us four and no more, but the bigger kingdom of God. 
In order to do this, we've got to be committed to what God is calling us to. We've got to be committed to loving God, loving people. We've got to com be committed to the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to change lives. We have got to keep looking at the world and saying Jesus is the answer that you need. Y'all, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Keep serving those around you. Keep being generous. Keep being loving. Keep loving God and loving people. Keep all of that up. And your church will be part of the growth of the kingdom of God. Now, we left Paul last week in, in, in Philippi. He had met Lydia. He had, he had begun to lead people to Christ. And Philippi, as I said last week, Philippi was going to be kind of his center of operations from this point forward. His biggest area of support was going to be Philippi from this point forward throughout the rest of his life. But that doesn't mean that Philippi was going to be without controversy or without trouble. What we find in the rest of chapter 16 and through the first half of chapter 17 is we find that Paul in three different occasions, in three different cities, Paul and Silas face opposition, and I mean violent opposition. I mean, they are jailed, and, it, and, and there's, the, there's a miraculous escape from jail that God provides for them. They, they, go, into, they go into these three different cities, and every time, y'all, sometimes, listen, 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 sometimes the Jews that are opposing them, the people that hate them, the people that are causing them problems, sometimes they follow them from town to town and refuse to leave them alone. Even when they leave town, these folks are so angry with them that they chase them down and bring trouble to them in the next place. Sometimes trouble chases you. And sometimes trouble chases you because of the gospel of Christ. That's not something to be upset about. It's just something to know exists. It happened in Paul's case. It's going to happen in our case. Now, when we get into chapter 17, Paul goes to a town called Berea. And again, he has the Jews follow him around and they agitate the crowds and he's in trouble. He's in danger again. Chapter, chapter 17, verse 14, Acts chapter 17, verse 14 the believers immediately, it said, sent Paul to the coast because they're trying to, they're trying to protect him. They sent Paul to the coast, uh, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens. So he leaves and he goes now to Athens. And then they left instructions with, with him for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. So Silas and Timothy, his traveling companions, they're in Berea. Paul is sent ahead because there's such danger here. There's so much anger in the streets. They send him on. He gets to Athens, kind of the, kind of the political center of the area he is in. And so he's in Athens, Greece, and he is by himself. Now, I, I want you to know that the Apostle Paul, everywhere he goes, speaks to people about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. Every time he goes further away from Jerusalem, there are fewer people that understand the words he's speaking. You see, when you preach Jesus in Jerusalem in this day and age... There are still people in Jerusalem that knew Jesus, that saw him, that watched him be crucified, that were there the day that he, he raised from the dead. They, they saw him. There, there are people in Jerusalem that knew or even still know Jesus' family. But once you get further away from Jerusalem, further away from Israel, then the stories Paul would tell about Jesus have less and less context for his hearers. They do not know how to receive the words he's saying. Because listen, let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just say this. Because he may be using the same vocabulary. In other words, they're speaking the same language. But they're not using the same dictionary. Can I just say to you that in today's world, in today's culture, we are often, as Christians, still using the same vocabulary we have used for 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, some of us who have followed God that long for 30, 40, 50 years. But the world around us has changed the dictionary. I need you to understand, they have not changed the vocabulary. They're still using the same words. They just don't mean the same things anymore. And we are now kind of like Paul. The further away from Israel we get, 
the less people understand our words for what we are actually trying to say. So watch, watch. The further away from America as a Christian nation we get, and we are farther away from that now than we were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, the further away from that we get, the more people do not have a context in which to understand our words. They don't understand why they need Jesus. They don't understand what sin is. They don't understand any of these concepts. And therefore, we've got to find ways to communicate with them. And we've got to find new and innovative ways to communicate with them so that we understand what their dictionary says that word means, even if it's not what we believe that word means. Let me, let me give you an illustration. Chapter 17 of Acts. I'm going to start reading verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, remember, he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to come because they've stayed in Berea. He's gone on to Athens. He's now waiting on them to get there. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Now listen, two things I really want you to pick up here. Let me give you the first one that's not part of the sermon, but it really is part of the thought. Paul cannot not share the gospel of Jesus Christ. All he's supposed to be doing right now in terms of what people have told him is go to Athens and wait on Silas and Timothy. You don't need to do anything. Just wait. Yo, hey, Paul, Paul, take a few days off, would you? And he can't do it. He gets out. He starts looking around. And it says he is greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Well, of course it was. The, Athens is the center of what was the Greek culture. And Greek culture served just a, a myriad of gods. And there are all of these idols to all of these Greek gods. And there are idols to other gods that have invaded Athens because they've come from other cultures that Greek, Greece con conquered, or now Rome has conquered. And they're bringing their own gods into Athens. So Athens is just filled with idols. Now watch. The fact that there are so many idols in the city distresses Paul. Well, of course it does. Because Paul is a Jew and he knows full well you're not supposed to have any idols before, the, before God, the God of heaven. Nobody's supposed to have any idols and this place is full of them. And it's frustrating for him. It, 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 he, he has that dark feeling that you get when you walk into a place that's not focused on your God or doesn't care about your God. That dark feeling that's, that when, I, I don't know if you've ever done this, but sometimes I've walked into places where, where honestly the power of the enemy is so strong that there's a darkness to the place. He's got that feeling in Athens and he doesn't know what to do with it. He's frustrated with it. He is distressed by it. Listen to me, listen to me, listen, listen to this. Our current culture can feel that way. It can feel to us like our culture that when we were, when we were children was a Christian culture. And now all of a sudden it's not, and it's distressing. If you are going to speak to the world about Jesus and the world's need for Jesus, let me, let, let's just start here. Be smart about it. Be smart, which means don't lead with your frustrations. Paul could have walked out and said, what are you people doing with all these idols? Don't you understand how bad these idols are? Don't you know God hates idols? Don't you know God hates this? You are doing stuff that God hates, and therefore God's not going to love you, and you're going to die and go to hell. Now, he could have done that. But what good would it have done? It wouldn't have won anybody to Christ. It would have just made them angry, because quite frankly, the people in Athens don't have a clue what he's talking about. What do you mean the God of heaven? What do you mean that God, that God doesn't like idols? God is an idol. These idols are two gods. That's how they hear it. Same words, different definition. Paul says God, and he means the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob. They hear God, and they're thinking that idol is a God, and that idol is a God, and that idol is a God, and that idol over there is God, and that temple is to a God, and that temple is to another God. That's what they're hearing. Same word, different definitions. If Paul goes out and just starts yelling about his frustrations, he's not going to communicate to anybody. He's just going to tick people off. In fact, he's just going to be a jerk because he is speaking to them in, in ways they don't even know how to understand. Friends, listen to me. Friends, listen to me. As Christians in today's world, and look, I am 54 years old. 
And I, I remember when I first started in ministry, you could start a conversation with somebody about Jesus and you could start right there because they already, they, had, they knew God, they knew Jesus, they had some type of church back, background. Everybody had some. In fact, our first church that Tina and I pastored, uh, were, were assistant pastors in was in a little town in North Carolina called Kings Mountain. Kings Mountain, North Carolina. We decided what we were going to do was call every household in that town. Back then, this is really prior to cell phones. Everybody still had a home phone and they answered it. And so we sat down and we, we took all of the phone numbers in the entire town. We divvied it out amongst people in the church. We gave them a script and everybody, we called every house in that town. You know what we learned? 90 some percent of them not only said that they believed in Jesus, they told us which church they went to. It was that high. It, it, it was insanely high. No, there's no way they were all telling us the truth because the churches were not all full and there weren't enough churches to hold everybody in town if everybody went. So they weren't all being honest with us. I'm just, I just got to tell you. But all of, them knew, all of them knew the story. Therefore, I want to show you this. Back then, you could knock on somebody's door They'd come to the door, you did not know them, and you could lead. They taught you to lead with this question. If you died tonight, do you know you were going to heaven? Okay, that question worked back then because they had a spiritual background. They had a church background. They had a Christian church background that taught them that at death, you had a, there, there, there was a binary choice between heaven and hell. That was in their thinking already. So when you started and you asked that question, that question made sense to them. Listen to me. For a, a large majority of the people around us today, if you lead with that question, it makes no sense and you are the creepiest human they've met all day. It just, it won't work. Why? The, because we're using the same words, but the definitions have changed. We're using the same words, but we're not using the same dictionary anymore. We have to understand that we are not Paul preaching to Christians in Jerusalem. We are now Paul preaching to Christians in Athens. We no longer live in a Christian society. And because of that, we've got to begin to, we, we, we've got to, begin to speak their language. We cannot lead a church. An awful lot of the society around us right now knows what we're against. They're clear on what we're against because we yell about it all the time. We're against this, we're against that, we're against this law, we're against that law, we're against this group, we're against that group. They know what the church is against. But can I ask you a question? Do they know what we are for? Do they know what we're about? They don't look at the church anymore in this culture and see people that love, love God and love people. They look at the church and see people that hate this group or hate that group or they're angry about this law or they're angry about that law because that's what the church has become. We've got to stop being that. We cannot lead with our frustrations because they don't understand our frustrations because they don't even speak our language because they're not from our cultural background. We're no longer in Jerusalem. We are now in Athens. Now watch. Watch what Paul does. So he reasoned in the synagogue. He starts with people that should be speaking his language. He starts with people that should be speaking his language with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. So these people know the language. As well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. These are people who, who don't know his religious background. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. They took him on because they're hearing words they didn't understand. Listen, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? You see that? They're not speaking the same language. So all they hear out of him is him babbling on about something that nobody understands. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. You see it? They're not, they're not hearing him for what he's trying to say. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and they brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears. You're using words we don't understand and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians at the, and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Now watch, two things happen here. He is rejected by some of them 
and others want to hear what he has to say. If you're going to share the gospel in this culture, you've got to be smart. Don't lead with your frustrations. Okay, don't lead with your frustrations. He doesn't do that anywhere here. He doesn't lead with, you've got to tear down all these idols. He doesn't lead with that. He, he, he doesn't start there. You've got to secondly, don't lead with your frustrations, but be consistent. You've got to be consistent. Don't quit. Don't quit when your first attempt is rejected. Paul's first attempt is rejected at the synagogue among the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. He's rejected there. He is then rejected again by some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who simply called him a babbler. But some people did engage. Some people did say, hey, we want to hear more about this. May we know what this teaching is that you are presenting. Some people were willing to hear it. It did not mean they were going to accept it, but they were willing to listen to him. Listen to me. You cannot, you cannot simply quit because the first person you talk to says no to you. Nobody ever accomplishes anything when they fail once and don't try again. You look, you, you, when you fail the first time, when somebody won't listen to you the first time, talk again, talk to somebody else, keep doing it, be consistent. I'm not saying, again, how many times do I say this in, in, in my preaching? But I'm not saying be a jerk. I'm saying be consistent. Consistently say, talk about, preach, let people hear about the Jesus that can set them free. Keep talking about Jesus. Love God, love people. Keep talking about Jesus. Be consistent. Now watch. The, the, the philosophers then bring him. They bring him to a place called the Areopagus. Now I've been to this place in Athens. It's really just a big rock. But at this rock is where the philosophers and the thinkers of the day, they would gather and they would all listen to each other's thoughts. They would all listen to what each other had to say. So when Paul comes in and he starts talking about something that is new, what seems to be foreign gods, what, 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 what is he talking about? What are these words he's using? He seems to be using the same words we're using, but they don't seem to mean the same thing. And all of a sudden they're not hearing right. They said, wait, we want to know what this teaching is. Come here and let us understand what you're saying. They're willing to listen to him. But I want, you to show, I want to show you something. Verses 22 and 23. It said, they invited him in. So Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, watch what he says. People of Athens, I see that in every way you are religious. He compliments them. I'm going to talk to you about God and I see that you care about gods. I see that you care about religion. He does not start with, you need to tear down all these idols because these idols are not of God. He doesn't start there. He starts with, I see that you care about gods. I see that you are in every way religious, to which they went, well, yes, we are. And that made them feel good. Then, then he says, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, he's not bashing them. He's not saying at these horrible, vile idols that you need. No, your objects of worship. I look careful at, carefully at your objects of worship. I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Now, wait, there's a better way to say this. I don't really think he said it this way. So yeah, I think what he said was, so this thing you do not know about, I'm going to explain to you. This thing that is unknown to you, I want to introduce to you. This God that you have not yet come to know, I want to introduce you to. That's where he starts. Watch. If you're going to communicate in today's culture, the gospel of Christ, you've got to be smart. Don't lead with frustration. Okay? You've got to be consistent. Don't quit when your first attempt is rejected. And you've got to be understandable. Listen carefully to me. You've got to start where they are, not where you are. That's why it won't work anymore to knock on somebody's door and ask them, if you died tonight, where would you spend eternity? That does not compute in the minds of the majority of human beings you and I live around. Not anymore. Not anymore. And maybe, I, maybe I'm upsetting you. Maybe you've never realized that. Maybe you, think it, maybe you think I'm wrong on this point. 
Uh, surveys and studies tell me I'm not wrong on this point. But, but maybe you think I am. But I'm here to tell you, you can't start there. You can't start with your frustrations. You can't start with words they don't understand. You've now got to be understandable. Start where they are. Look, Paul says, listen, listen, I see that you've got all these gods around here. You're very religious. This is really amazing what I'm looking at. In fact, you know what? I even found this, this, one, this one God that you've got an inscription that says that you don't know who this God is. I think that's the God I know. Let me, let me introduce you to that God, because I think that God will help you to understand all the other ones. Let me talk to you about that. And all of a sudden, they're interested. Listen, if Paul had started with these idols you've got, they're evil, and you guys are so confused, you guys are out of your mind, I can't believe you've got all If he had started there, they would not be open to hear anything he says. And that's what happens when we start with our frustrations. That's what happens when we don't start where they are with their language. That's what happens when we insist that they suddenly somehow receive what we believe even though they haven't heard it yet. Do you, do you realize how, how, how nonsensical that is? And yet that's the way the church works. We want, y'all, y'all, as a church, far too often we're expecting a lost world to act like a Christian theologian. And that's just not going to happen. People that don't know Jesus don't act like Jesus. We've got to introduce them to Jesus before we expect any change in their thinking or their behavior or any change in the way they handle society around them. Folks, listen to me. We've got to be understandable in today's culture. We've got to talk to people from a vantage point they can understand, from a vantage point of acceptance from a vantage point of love for one another, from a vantage point of, of finding ways to forgive each other. We, we can talk about these things. People see, look, everybody around you sees the struggles that frustrate you. And they're frustrated by them too for different reasons. If you can start where somebody is and show where Jesus becomes the answer to that problem, you can get people to receive and understand and accept what what Jesus wants to offer them, which is forgiveness. Look, listen, listen, listen. I want to show you something. I want to show you something. Everybody knows the world is jacked up. Everybody around us knows that. Everybody around you knows our current society is in trouble and, it, and there are problems and there's crime and there's hate and there's, there's anger. Everybody, everybody knows that. You know what most of them don't know? that the anger and the crime and the hate and the pain is caused by sin. They don't know that. And if all you do is say, if you'd stop sinning, you'd stop hurting. They don't even understand what you're saying. That, that it's not a phrase. They know the word sin, but sin for them, watch. Sin for us as Christians is any, is any, is a willful, is a willful transgression of a known law of God. It's when we break God's law. That's sin. We know that. And therefore, everybody sins. We know that, but we use the same word. But in our culture currently, sin is something that murderers do. Sin is something that rapists do. Sin's not something I do. Sin is awful. Hitler sinned. I don't sin. You see, the definition has changed. In functionality, the definition has changed. You say, well, I looked it up in Webster's and it says, no, 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 stop it. The functional definition that the people around you use has shifted. And if you say to somebody, I love you, but I hate the sin in your life. You know what they're hearing? I love you, but I hate you. That's what they're hearing. Because what you're calling sin, they're calling their choices and their lifestyles. What you're calling sin, they're calling their preference. What you're calling sin, they're calling, they're calling their, their tendency, their bent, their reality. And you're calling that a sin. And if you do that, they're not hearing, I, I love you, but I kind of hate what you do. Because if you hate what they do, you hate them. Because what they do defines them in today's world. It shouldn't, but it does. Therefore, if we don't understand the language they're using, we're simply going to offend them and we're never going to communicate. Paul did not step up and say, people of Athens, I see that you are all horrible sinners, nasty, heathen, pig dog sinners. You have all these idols. They must be torn down. They must be burned, burned down the temples. He ended up in jail again. 
Instead, he said, I see that you're religious in every way. Let me talk to you about that. Let me talk to you about this one God you don't know. He met them where they are. Oh, if I could get the church to do this. Oh, if I could get us to understand this. And then it goes forward. He preaches to them. We get down to verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, watch. Some of them sneered. They made fun of him. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named, uh, named Damaris, and a number of others. Listen, be patient. If you're going to communicate the gospel to people, you've got to be smart. Don't lead with your frustration. You've got to be consistent. Don't quit when your first attempt is rejected. You've got to be understandable. Meet them where they are, not where you are. And finally, you've got to be patient. Not everyone will believe. Listen. Not even Billy Graham won everybody. Not everyone will believe. But praise God for the ones who do. Give God praise for Dionysius. Give God praise for Damaris. Give God praise for the people who do follow, who do hear, who do find Christ. And by the way, I want, to, I want you to hear this. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. They found Christ by following Paul. Is that the life you're living? You see, in the end, what they're going to see is they're going to see if you actually believe what you say you believe. They're going to see if you actually walk what you talk. And when they saw that, they believed the God that Paul was teaching. I have to tell you, I think the church is very broken in this area. I think we are very good at using words that people don't understand. But what we've got to become good at is using words they do understand to introduce them to a God that they desperately need, even though they don't yet realize it. Pray with me. Oh, Holy Spirit, give us opportunity. Give us words. Give us patience. Give us peace. And in the end, give us the souls of men, women, and children who desperately need your forgiveness and your presence and your power. And we will give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. I hope that ministered powerfully to you. I know that every single time uh, we look at the book of Acts and we see God moving powerfully through the Apostle Paul or Peter, whoever it is that we're studying, it can just really stir our hearts up. And I hope that your heart stirred up. But before we move on and say even goodbye for the rest of the week, we just want to encourage you to think through what did God specifically speak to you? He speaks to all of us generally, but when we hear messages like this, there's always a takeaway. There's always something that we, at least one thing, mm -hmm. that we know that we need to do about what we've heard. So what was it for you? Is it about sharing your faith? Is it about uh, the fact that maybe somebody, not everybody's gonna hear the word the same way, but someone's gonna come to him? I mean, what is it that you need to do about what you heard? Mm -hmm. So I want you to think through that and Feel free to chat with us, yeah. to talk with whoever um, maybe you're at your watch party with, or if you're watching this alone, um, you can just actually connect with us, and Emily's going to tell you at least one way that you can do that. Yeah, we really, really want to invite you guys and hope that you take us up on filling out our Connect card. And the way that you do that is by texting 94000, the word N-L-Y-H, Connect. You'll see it on the screen. And the value of that, the reason for that, is that we want to get to know you. We have a church of people that, in, in a traditional church setting, you get to see everything. Everybody. You get to, to see faces and to get to know people every right. week. And we can't do that unless you guys let us know you're watching. And so we just want to know you. We want to pray for you. You can put prayer requests. You can ask questions. You can join the team. You can just give your name so that we know you're watching and we yeah. can start lifting your name up. But we want to invite you to take take us up on that. Um, and you will get a phone call from a pastor. You will get real human interaction. We will uh, get to be the everywhere church with a virtual sermon as opposed to maybe you just watching alone and feeling not connected right now. So mm -hmm. go ahead and text 94000. We can't wait to hear from you. We can't wait to talk with you. Yeah, again, thanks so much for being with us. We've been loving this series. We're going to continue on with season four in just like two weeks from now. So we're pumped about that. You're going to love uh, season four. It's crazy. But for now, we look forward to seeing you next week. 
and hope you have a great one. God bless.